thanks for being here. Yeah, thank you, Virginia, and thanks to Broadreach. Thanks um, to you guys for all tuning in from all over. Um, I had a question in the beginning of people telling me their favorite marine animal. I got a lot of uh, sea turtles and some sharks, um, which you're in luck because some of our upcoming um, Broadreach talks are going to cover those in more depth. Um, but some animals that don't get as much love, although some people love octopuses and um, cephalopods like me, um, we're going to talk about those today because they don't often get a lot of attention and they're so cool. So there's so many cool things I want to share with you today. Oh, tunicates, rad. Um, okay. Let's see. I might have to. Okay. So just a quick outline of um, what I'm going to talk about. So how do we classify organisms? So we're going to start with some a little bit of biology overview. Um, what is an invertebrate? And then we'll go through some of the commonly found marine invertebrates, um, some characteristics and cool features of each of the groups. So how do we classify organisms? There is so much diversity in the world and we've classified things into categories or groups to understand their sort of evolutionary relationship. Um, and this process is called taxonomy. And it's constantly changing, particularly with invertebrates, and, and even more so in the ocean because we're constantly discovering new things and organisms are changing. And invertebrates are far the, by far the largest group in the animal kingdom. Over 90%, 97% of our animals are invertebrates. Over a million species have been described. There's a ton of insects and there's tons more to be discovered. So how do we group all of these tons of organisms? Um, we use a classification um, uh, coined by Car Carlos, uh, Car Carolus Linnaeus um, way back in the day. And this is how we group organisms or study them um, via taxonomy. And so the order that it goes is kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. And that's how we break down groups of organisms from larger categories down to species, the smallest category. Now, I learned a mnemonic to remember this. Um, called, it's kings play chess on fine grain sand. Not that exciting. I don't know. That was the one that stuck with me. If you have a really cool one, I've heard one about spaghetti. Go ahead and type it into the uh, chat box. Maybe there's a new one that will stick with in my brain. But anyway, we're going to be focusing on the top level, so the phylum and classes of, um, oh, a soup one, yep, I heard spaghetti, it's spaghetti, but soup. Um, and so the scientific name, I'm going to introduce a few of those to you, some of my favorite critters, um, and those are always written with the genus first and then the species, always italicized with the genus capitalized and the species lowercase. Now the species is really the only explicit kind of easy to understand grouping and that those are individuals that can interbreed and produce fertile offspring. So that's how we define a species. So how do we define invertebrates? So you may know what an invertebrate is, but it's basically animals that don't have a bony skeleton or internal, um, internal uh, bones basically. Um, and, but they do have a lot of times outer hard structures and they are classified into like over 33 groups or phyla. And some of the common marine ones, sorry, when I move my mouse, sometimes my clicking between slides doesn't work as well. But the, I'm gonna talk about six marine invertebrate phyla. So first, the echinodermata. Those are animals like your sea star. Uh, periphera, that includes animals like sponges. So we've got some SpongeBob SquarePants characters up here. Uh, your cnidaria, those are your jellies and your anemones. Your annelida, those are uh, your worms. Arthropoda, so your crabs and a lot of your um, plankton-like animals, your copepods or isopods, uh, like the character plankton. 
And then your mollusca, so your snails and octopus um, are in that group. So up first, echinodermata. So echino meaning spiny, and derm, you might be able to guess, skin. So your echinoderms are all your spiny skin animals. So your sea cucumbers, your sea stars, your sand dollars are actually in this group. They all actually have pentaradial symmetry. Um, so penta meaning five, radial symmetry uh, meaning around. And this is really easy to see in sea stars because they have five or more arms extending from a central disc and their mouth faces the bottom or the substrate. Um, this is another picture of something cool about sea stars. Instead of um, you know, having blood or veins or capillaries like uh, a lot of animals, they have a water vascular system. And they have these tube feet. So these are tube feet are how they attach to rocks, how they move, and they also um, provide chemical signals. And water enters their water vascular system through this um, thing that many people might think is an eye on the top, but it's actually called the madroporite. Um, and that's where the water enters the vascular system. This is a picture of what tube feet look like. If you've ever seen um, a sunflower star or a pycnopodia, they're a really large sea star that unfortunately their populations are declining here in the west coast of California. Um, but I highly encourage you to Google a video of a uh, Pycnopodia or sunflower star eating or moving. They have a ton of tube feet and they move actually pretty quick. Um, these tube feet extend, and this is why if you ever went um, tide pooling in the rocky intertidal or were out and saw a sea star, you wouldn't want to rip it off the rock because you would rip off some of these tube feet. Now what's cool about um, echinoderms is that they can regenerate. Um, but still not so nice to rip off their feet. Um, this is just a picture of the internal structure showing you that uh, pentaradial symmetry. I thought this was a really cool graphic. I'm not going to get too much into internal anatomy, but um, particularly for the echinoderms, their, their internal structures are really unique and cool. And I wanted to highlight um, up here on the left uh, top where it says A, the pedicellaria. Um, if you've ever gone to an aquarium and they have touch tanks, what you can do is place um, the back of your hand along many sea stars and they'll grab onto your hairs with those pedicellaria. So they have these cool little um, kind of pinchers, uh, a lot of echinoderms do. Um, and that's just a picture of kind of how the, the water vascular system works and where their mouth is on the underside of their body. So some of the other echinoderms, like I said, they all have that pentaradial symmetry. So if you put your hand out like this, here you're, you can see kind of almost symmetrical. Urchins also have it. You basically curve your hand like that and you're an urchin. And then sea cucumber, kind of like that. So they all have pentaradial symmetry. And they're, all, they're all fairly similar. Um, urchins, got to give those guys some love. This is what I studied in my master's. Um, the tube feet on urchins extend all the way from the top of their body down to the bottom. And the pentaradial symmetry is evident in their test. Um, if any of you guys have ever seen a test out there, I have one to show you. This is the internal um, structure of a sea urchin. So pretty cool. So the ossicles, this is kind of their internal bone-like structure. They use their spines for protection, um, gathering food, and their mouth is on the bottom, so they graze along rocks uh, along the bottom of the ocean or wherever they're living. They have a really interesting mouth. Um, it's called the Aristotle's Lantern, so named after a philosopher. You can see this picture on the right. It's a pretty complex jaw system of ossicles and muscles, and this allows them to graze a ton. So in kelp forests here in California, if our urchin populations get too high, uh, it reduces a lot of our kelp, which is not a great thing because these guys can eat a ton of kelp if they're kind of not checked by other fish and predators. Um, I read something interesting. So there's debate about how this uh, feature was named, if it was 
basically named on the lantern itself, or I think more likely based on the outside of the test maybe being used as a lamp. Kind of looks more lamp-like to me than the internal one. But anyway, Aristotle's lantern. And then the sea cucumbers. Uh, so cool. Um, this is a really uh, close-up structure of the California warty sea cucumber and their podia or their tube feet actually out. Um, so these guys graze along the bottom, sucking in a lot of sand and debris, um, pooping it out. So they're all over um, the world, sea cucumbers in a variety of forms. If they get stressed, um, they can do what's called evisceration. So most uh, echinoderms can eviscerate. So it kind of looks like spaghetti. Hopefully you've never been out harassing a sea cucumber in order to see this, but if you were lucky diving and some other predator was getting at it, it looks like spaghetti. It's stinky, it's like kind of gross. And what that does um, is basically if a predator is threatening a cucumber, it can spit out its guts, the rest of the sea cucumber can then get away. And the predator either is gonna be really grossed out or it's gonna be like, yum, meal, I'm gonna eat all these guts. And the sea cucumber can then regenerate, um, but it does take a while. So you wouldn't wanna go out there and shake a cucumber until it happens. Definitely not, no, no, no. Um, sea stars also do evisceration. So in this photo in the upper right, imagine if we were eating and we went out to eat and instead of like using a fork or spoon, we threw up our stomach onto the plate, digested everything there and then slurped it all back up. That's like how a sea star eats. They don't even wait to digest the food until their stomach is back in their body. They digest it mostly outside of their body. So pretty interesting. Um, the stomachs look very unique too. If you've ever seen them, they kind of billow out. Some are quite large. Um, last thing, a cool feature is pearlfish. Um, in college, I got to study abroad in French Polynesia and uh, near Tahiti. And one of the groups studied sea cucumbers, the relationship with pearl fish. And so many sea cucumbers actually have fish living inside their bodies. Um, and these, these fish are called pearl fish. And this, uh, you can also something you could look up on YouTube, um, look up some documentaries about pearl fish. They'll actually knock on the cloaca or the outside mouth slash anus of a sea cucumber. If there's any pearl fish living inside, other ones will let them know and be like, oh, there's room in here, it's nice or not. It's kind of cool. But pearlfish living inside sea cucumbers, another weird, fun one. Uh, next phylum is the periphera. So many pores, um, that's how you can think of sponges. Um, cool thing about sponges is there's a lot of different types. So they are um, anywhere from like tiny crustos, let me see if I can go back, um, thin on rocks to like meters in size. So this, this big one on, on the left would be a, an older mature sponge. Uh, tons of different species. They are mostly marine, not a lot of freshwater sponges. Uh, they are sessile, which means they don't move. Most of them are hermaphroditic, which means they have eggs and sperm, so male and female parts. And they grow in a ton of uh, variety of body shapes. So tubes, barrels, crusts, um, all kinds of different um, sponge varieties. Next up we have our cnidaria. So if you were on the talk earlier this week with Megan, she talked about cnidaria. So these are your corals and your anemones and your jellies. All cnidaria are radially symmetrical. Um, and they all possess stinging cells called nematocysts. And these are little harpoon-like structures. So even anemones, if you were able to touch one in a touch tank, they do have stinging cells. They're just not as strong as something like a, a jelly might have. So they just feel a little bit um, sticky. But all cnidarians have um, those nematocysts or stinging cells. And they all have a polyp and medusa stage. So at one form of their life, they all kind of look like an anemone or like a jelly. Uh, next up, we have our Annelida, so our segmented worms. Um, ton of varieties. My favorite down at the bottom is the Christmas tree worms. These burrow into coral reefs. There's a ton of different colors, um, and they put out, put out kind of their mouth parts and appendages for feeding. And if you ever are passing by, you'll see them all kind of suck in really quick. 
Um, on the bottom left, we have a fireworm. Those are really voracious predators on coral reefs. Um, all of our annelids or our annelida worms are bilater bilaterally symmetrical and um, they're worm shaped, obviously. Uh, this is known as veriform. So they're soft bodied and they're generally longer than they are wide and they are segmented. So their bodies consist of uh, repeating segments. And they also have some unique uh, mouth structures. So in this picture in the upper right, you can see sometimes if you're, if you're very um, patient as a diver, you might see a worm feeding and you might see some of those interesting uh, mouth appendages coming out. Next, we have our arthropoda. This is a huge group of organisms. Um, these are your barnacles, a lot of your plankton, so your ostracods, your isopods here on the upper right, that's an isopod, your copepods, like your plankton from SpongeBob, your lobsters, your crabs. Um, gosh, there's a ton. <laughs> there's a ton of arthropods. So this uh, ton of diversity, there's over a million species of arthropod. A lot of them are marine. They all have a chitinous exoskeleton that they shed. Um, periodically. Arthro means uh, segmented or jointed and pod means foot. So they all have segmented or jointed feet. Um, this is a picture of me as a decorator crab uh, <laughs> at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. This is one of my first jobs in marine science. Fortunately, I got to do other things at the aquarium, um, educating people other than just scaring children in costumes. Um, but you can't see the back of it, but decorator crabs are super cool. They have all these little, um, almost like Velcro on their backs. And to camouflage, they'll put a ton of like algae. They'll even have anemones growing on there. So uh, very interesting decorator crab. Uh, shout out to the Monterey Bay Aquarium. If you ever get out to California in that area and it's open, um, I'm a little bit biased, but I think it's one of the best aquaria in the world. It really showcases a lot of our local species on the West Coast and is really big on conservation and research. So highly check it out if you haven't been. Um, upper right corner, hermit crabs are also in our phylum arthropoda. This guy, unfortunately, somebody uh, might have taken some of their shells. And so he's built a unique shell out of uh, something else. So hermit crabs, will, once they get bigger, will change shells. And that's an important reason why we should not collect shells. Um, I'm gonna be showing some that I have for education, but generally um, collecting shells is a bad idea because not only are you depriving other people from seeing it, but you also might be taking a home of another critter. A uh, cool feature about arthropods are book gills. And I had to show this picture of a crab reading a book because man, internet has so many different weird things out there. But if you've ever been close enough to see the gills of a lobster or a crab, they um, maximize surface area. And so they have these book gills that are thin little pages. And these allow for a ton of oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange. Um, and horseshoe crabs can also even use them as paddles or to propel them. So pretty cool. I know a lot of people are fascinated by horseshoe crabs. Um, if you're somebody that has some facts about horseshoe crabs, definitely type them into the chat, share them with the group. Um, they're pretty interesting animals. Okay, next phylum is mollusca. So these are animals like your abalone. Um, these are all uh, soft bodied animals generally, and they have some type of shell, although in your squid and your octopus, um, they're vastly reduced and internal. Um, but the, all the phyla, the animals in the, the phylum mollusca have soft bodies and some type of um, shell. So your snails, your chitin, your limpet, a lot of intertidal creatures, your squid, your cuttlefish, these are all in the group um, mollusca. Cool feature or rad feature of mollusca is their tongue-like structure. It's called a radula. Um, this picture on the bottom left and, and right kind of reminds me of actually of a dermal denticles in sharks. If anybody's a big shark fan, their skin almost looks a little bit like this, but this is the tongue of a snail. So this picture on the, the lower right, that's a, a pellet's whelk. 
And you might think that a Kellett's whelk or a snail is not a very important or big, big time predator. Oh, no, no. These guys eat voraciously with this radula and they can get quite big. So they're actually really important um, on rocky reefs because they feed a bunch of different things with that radula. Um, those are lost in bivalves. So bivalves are your things like your muscles. Um, shown up here in the upper right. So anything with two shells, so your clams, uh, your gooey duck clams, your giant clams, these are all called bivalves. One of my favorite bivalves is the oyster. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, oysters at the end and what I do currently working with oysters. Um, but bivalves very important because they provide a lot of structure uh, particularly here in um, on the West Coast, these mussels and oysters provide so many benefits to shorelines here. So very important animals. Uh, another cool feature of the octopus, had to definitely talk about these guys. Um, so octopus, very unique. Um, like cuttlefish, they can camouflage in a ton of crazy ways. Um, and they also are one of the few species that can use tools. So it's not quite like this picture that I have on the left. I just thought it was an interesting kind of funny picture, but they've been shown to use coconut shells, um, clam shells, things for camouflage. Um, they've also done a lot of different studies on them in Aquaria showing they can actually solve puzzles and mazes, open bottles, very unique, very cool creatures. Gotta love, gotta love the octopus. Another cool uh, mollusk is the sea hare. Um, so sea hares, like other mollusks or sea slugs, have a lot of different varieties of body types. Um, they are hermaphrodites. And if sea hares are harassed, they will ink. Um, and this is a very unique compound. So it will kind of um, basically destabilize their uh, predators. It almost acts like um, it will make a lot, if a lobster was coming up to try to eat a sea hare, it will kind of like, take out all of its senses, like its um, audit, its uh, nasal senses, I'm, I'm blanking on my words, but it's a sticky, interesting chemical compound um, that if, if stressed, sea hairs will ink and it can uh, totally uh, debilitate its predator. Another cool thing about the sea hairs is that um, their ink depends, the, the chemical compound depends on what type of algae they eat. And we get some really large sea hairs out here on the west coast, um, another cool critter. Uh, last but not least, the nudibranchs. Yay, nudibranchs. Uh, I keep saying I have favorites, but gosh, look at the nudibranchs. They are amazing. Uh, nudie meaning naked and brank meaning gill. So these are your naked gills. They are a mollusk, uh, a sea slug. And they come in so many different color forms. There's over 3,000 species. Um, everyone's getting excited. I love it. Got to geek out on nudibranchs. Um, you have to be a good diver with good buoyancy and be going slow to see these guys on the reef. But if you're ever so lucky, they are so cool. Um, they have dorid nudibranchs. And um, they have these rhinophores on their um, top that allow them to sense uh, things, sense things, I'm just getting so excited. I don't even know what I'm talking about. New brain, they're just so cool. So many things I could say. I could have a whole talk on them. Um, they have really interesting color morphs to kind of deter predators. They often can um, take in stinging cells from other animals and hold them in their tissues so that they can be toxic to um, other critters. And uh, just at the end here, man, the day I found this website, I kind of freaked out. So there's a site, I believe it's on Tumblr, called Bowie Branchia, and it's comparing uh, David Bowie outfits to different nudibranchs. So if you've got some time in quarantine, I highly suggest that you Google this, because, I mean, amazing. I gotta love David Bowie, you gotta love the nudibranch. Um, so sea slugs, very important critters. Um, lastly, I loved Megan's talk this week, who was talking about, um, you know, what you can do at home to kind of help the oceans and help conservation. My talk today was basically about biology and just loving invertebrates, giving those little guys that are often, you know, a little bit neglected some love. But 
I wanted to talk a little bit about what I currently do. So I mentioned oysters. So I work for a nonprofit in Southern California and I am restoring the native Olympia oyster, which is nearly functionally extinct in Southern California. And as I mentioned, it's a really important habitat. And we're also restoring it along with eelgrass. Um, so separately and together, we're looking at how oysters and eelgrass interact in our bays and estuaries and how that affects fish populations and shoreline stabilization. Uh, so the group I work for is called Orange County Coast Keeper. And if you wanna check out their website, we also do some like Zoom videos and educational um, series. And we're part of what's known as the Water Keeper Alliance. So I wanted to look up what um, might keeper be in, in North Carolina area, because I know some folks are joining from there. So if anybody knows if there's a keeper in, in North Carolina, let me know. But Water Keeper Alliance is a global organization and it's all about clean water. So uh, our mission is waters that are fishable, swimmable, drinkable, and sustainable. So we take a lot of volunteers and we do things like beach cleanup, um, and testing water quality and education. So if there's a group in your area, there might be a bay keeper or a coast keeper around you. So definitely check that out, see if they have any volunteer opportunities. Um, and if you're ever in the Orange County area, if you look at a coast keeper, maybe you can join um, one of our beach cleanups one day. That would be a great thing. Um, and with that, I'm going to say thank you and hopefully um, answer some questions. I wanted to give a shout out to the lovely Mary Dinsmore. She's gonna be talking next Friday. She's an amazing speaker. Um, so I can't wait to hear her talk and I hope you guys uh, join as well. Oh, thanks Katie. I saw one question come through to get our ball rolling on questions. Um, Kelsey asked if the pearl fish that go in the sea cucumbers are parasitic or not. So it's an interesting relationship. So as many people might know, you have like mutualism relationships where it benefits both animals. You have commensalism where it benefits one and it kind of doesn't, you know, affect the other one or parasitic. Um, I think for pearl fish, it goes in between being parasitic and commensal. So if you only have a few pearl fish in there, it can not really harm the cucumber too much. But if the cucumber gets some um, diseases or too many pearl fish in there, it can be like an added stressor. stressor. Um, but it also kind of depends on the species of pearl fish and cucumber. Um, so it can be a bit of both. So Sandra said there are river keepers in North Carolina. So that might be a, a group to check out to volunteer with. Um, nudibranchs look so clean and pristine. Is it just the color or how do they do that? So um, invertebrates have a wide variety of color morphs. A lot of times these are to signal to their predators that I'm toxic. Um, but nudibranchs, even though they have a wide diversity of colors, they're not always toxic they actually can um, harness toxins from other critters that they eat. Um, so they're not always toxic. A uh, question about the, the bivalve, that was a gooey duck, gooey duck clam. Somebody already answered it. Um, if I want, I could go back maybe. Yeah, that was a gooey duck clam. They're found in the mud, they burrow. I don't know if I can go back. Maybe if I, I might have to echo. Oh, there we go. All right, my screen's a little bit slow. But yeah, these are gooey duck clams. Um, so it's the bivalve. They have a, a large um, soft structure and they burrow into the mud. They're harvested and eaten um, all along the Pacific coast as well. Oh yeah, it was on Dirty Jobs. Yep. And you spelled it right, Kelsey. Good job. Do we have any other questions out there? Let's see if we got any in 
change that. Oh, can you talk more about oysters cleaning the water? I would love to. So oysters are filter feeders and they basically um, take in a ton of water up to like 30 gallons a day. And that's how they're important in improving water quality. Um, so they're a really important habitat. And basically we're trying to restore the native species here on the West Coast because our bays and estuaries are so modified through dredging and habitat modification and kind of coastal erosion that not only do they help to clean the water through filter feeding, they also help to stabilize the shoreline. Um, and this is really important in, in the phase of like rising sea levels and coastal erosion. And we think that restoring oysters um, can be a way to combat that. And um, this is really big also on the East Coast. There's a project, I saw somebody from New York uh, on, on here. There's a project called the Billion Oyster Project that's trying to restore oysters in New York Harbor. We have a ton, ton of cool videos and Coast Keeper does as well. We have a couple videos of my work on our website and YouTube um, if you wanna check those out. Um, so eating oysters, actually, I wouldn't encourage you not to eat oysters. Um, here on the West Coast, we're not doing a ton of oyster shell recycling but a lot of groups are. And basically this is a habitat for an oyster. And so what we're doing to restore oysters is putting out the shells of other oysters. Um, and so a lot of oysters actually are grown through aquaculture as well. So depending on where you're getting the oyster, it might be actually a good seafood choice because many of our aquaculture facilities here in the US anyway are pretty well regulated and um, one of the more sustainable seafood options that you can eat. Um, if you're interested in sustainable seafood, Monterey Bay Aquarium has a great program called Seafood Watch. Um, and they can, there's a lot of information online about how seafood is caught and whether or not it's a good choice environmentally. Uh, another question about bivalves and restoration. So yeah, uh, bivalve restoration is pretty big. We're not using mussels so much here um, out in the West Coast. We're primarily trying to restore the native oyster species. Um, but they do filter water and they help stabilize sediments. So it's an important restoration technique that I think is kind of uh, emerging. Yeah, and it's super big um, on the East Coast as well. Cool. Thanks, Katie. If you guys have more questions, go ahead and throw some more um, in the chat if you have them. I know I'll hang around for a little while and uh, Katie probably will too. I'm also going to put our sign up for Mary's talk about island ecology and endemism um, in the chat. If you haven't signed up already, you can go ahead and do it. It's next Friday at the same time. So if today worked for you, it'll probably work next week too. Uh, and I'll also put a link to sign up for our newsletter. If you haven't been getting our weekly newsletter, next week is all about islands. Um, and then after that, it's going to be shark week. So go ahead and get signed up with us so you can follow along and hear from more of our awesome Broadreach instructors like Katie. Thanks, Katie. Thank you guys. It was so fun to see all your faces and get all these great questions. Thank you for joining, sharing my love of invertebrate. <laughs> um, somebody asked me to talk about jellies. Um, well, there's a lot. There's a lot you could say about jellies. Um, I don't know what you want to know. Uh, some cool facts about jellies, the moon jelly, the Aurelia is thought to be um, to like have a never ending lifespan because uh, they're like colonial and just kind of regenerate. Um, there's a lot of diversity in the darians and jellies, everything from, you know, the moon jelly that has like almost no stinging cell to like man of war jellies. Um, I don't know what else to say about jellies. There's lots of there's lots of different varieties out there. They're um, primarily um, like a plankton. They don't uh, necessarily locomote on their own. Most are just kind of free floating, um, and they're filter feeders. Uh, so yeah. 
yeah, I, I think I said, do they move on their own or are they pushed by current? So they do have some, um, that Medusa form, you know, has some movement, but mainly their, their movements are based on current and wave, wave action. So it depends on the jelly how um, sophisticated their digestion is. A lot of times those nematocysts or their tentacles will trap prey um, and they have kind of digestive enzymes that will kind of attack the prey. Um, how rudimentary, these are really good questions. You should take an invertebrate zoology course, Kelsey, um, to really get into the depth with it. Um, but most of them, most of the jellies are not super sophisticated. Um, but yeah, rudimentary is a good word. They're, they have stinging cells and they kind of digest their prey um, using those. Uh, this is a good question about um, seashells from Mana. Eco-friendly product using powdered form of steam. Hmm. Uh, generally, I would steer clear of most products involving seashells, unless that was from a really reputable aquaculture facility and, and some kind of recycling. Uh, I'd have to look into it more to know where that's coming from, but um, generally, I would say we want to avoid um, a harvest that's not super necessary, but it's hard to say. You'd have to do some more research about that specific product. Hopefully that answered your question. Did I get everybody's questions pretty much? Um, a lot of, uh, I got a question about color. So they have uh, what are known as chromatophores. So your cuttlefish, your octopus have these, um, pore-like structures um, that change color. Uh, it'd be a longer explanation to go into it too much, but if you search chromatophores in um, cuttlefish or jellies, then you could find um, some more information on it. Cool. Thanks. I'm going to um, close the meeting down, but we will save the recording and we'll share that out um, on our following newsletters. So on Monday, you'll have the recording from Katie and Megan, and then we'll kind of cycle from there. Um, but thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, guys.